over the earth, there are giant stone monuments. Almost everyone knows they were created thousands of years ago by ancient man. But could almost everyone be wrong? According to the official history books, buildings like the pyramids and Stonehenge are triumphs of human engineering, which mark the beginning of our human civilization. But there are a few nagging questions about them, like why they seem to appear out of the blue. It's a mystery which has been troubling lots of people, including UFO gurus such as David Hatcher Childress. Well, one of the great enigmas of the past and of humanity is that people just like us have been around for at least a hundred thousand years. And then suddenly, a few thousand years ago, we just stepped out of our caves and started building all these giant monuments. One of the mysteries here is not only uh, how did ancient man build all these giant megalithic monuments, but why? Over the years, scientists have struggled to explain it. Some suggested it was to do with agriculture. The birth of agriculture meant we could suddenly feed armies of workers. Others said it was all about the birth of religion. Early civilizations were desperate to placate gods. But now, there's another explanation. One group of people say that most of these monuments were built or designed in the distant past by aliens who visited our planet with their super advanced technology. One believer is Jason Martell. He lives in California and runs a dating agency. But in his spare time, he's been grappling with the biggest archeological mystery of our time. And he says, he solved it. Man could have had the ability to physically stack those large blocks in Egypt and build that, a hundred thousand men. But the knowledge to do it had to come from somewhere else. There had to be some type of intervention. And that's why I look towards the ancient astronaut theory. Ancient astronauts from somewhere else came here and influenced our society. Jason and other believers say this idea would explain some baffling questions about ancient monuments. Take Stonehenge. How did Bronze Age Britons drag these five tonne stones over 170 miles? And then there's this 1,000 tonne block at Baalbek in the Lebanon. It weighs as much as three Boeing 747s. How did ancient man shift that? And then there's the biggest controversy of all, the Pyramids of Giza. The biggest one is made from two and a half million blocks of stone. It was built in just 20 years and is lined up exactly with the North Pole, less than one tenth of a degree out. According to the experts, the answer is simple. The ancient Egyptians were just terribly clever, worked very fast and very hard. And they created a whole tourist industry in only a few decades. But that doesn't convince the likes of Jason Martell. Many of the ancient sites around the world display a type of brilliance that we don't attribute to ancient man. If ancient man is living in clay huts and using stone tools. They're not going to have the advanced mathematics and geometry to lay out some of the sites that we have today. How did ancient man build things like Stonehenge? How did they get the Giza pyramids to line almost one tenth off a degree to actual north? So what do the official Egypt experts say? Egyptologists think there's no big mystery. Archaeologists, they say, have dug up lots of evidence near the pyramids. The broad features are fairly clear. We've got the barracks where the workmen lived, we've got the tombs of the architects. Also, for some of the unfinished pyramids, we have got the ramps which were used to drag the blocks into place. So although the minutiae of the construction process isn't known, probably is unknowable, I think the big picture is perfectly clear. The problem for believers in ancient alien astronauts is that we can't ask the aliens themselves. Uh, or can we? Lisa Royal Holt says that she knows that aliens built ancient monuments. 
That's because she is an intergalactic medium who's in direct spiritual contact with an alien called Sasha. Apparently, Sasha lives billions of miles away, but luckily, reception is crystal clear. Over to you, Lisa. Well, greetings to you. This is Sasha. It is a pleasure to be with you this day, and we are so excited that you have an interest in the subject matter. Our intentions for our interaction with Earth humans is absolutely, totally in peace, love, and joy. Thank you, Lisa. I mean, Sasha. That's very reassuring. But what about the pyramids? Who built them? In ancient days, my forefathers came to Earth. We were seeking a, another place to colonize. The monuments were built by extraterrestrials, usually for actual scientific purposes. OK, we'll be back with the aliens soon, so we can hear firsthand about what experiments they got up to. But first, let's meet the godfather of the ancient alien astronaut theory, the man scientists and archaeologists love to hate. Traditional archaeology don't like mysteries. They have the answer for everything. They just declare something, and the rest of the world has to believe it. In 1968, Eric von Daniken, a Swiss hotel manager, achieved international notoriety when he published a controversial theory which said that alien astronauts had visited Earth in our ancient past. Now, it wasn't the first time it had been suggested extraterrestrial beings had come to Earth in prehistoric times. This, after all, had been a staple of science fiction fantasy for years. But Eric's idea had a rather crucial difference. He said it was true. His book, Chariots of the Gods, sold more than 60 million copies worldwide. And he quickly became an international superstar. Eric seemed to give the world a brand new space age version of human history. Thousands of years ago, when our forefathers were still Stone Age people, some extraterrestrials arrived. Von Daniken argued that those extraterrestrials helped build ancient monuments. His career as a solver of ancient mysteries began, he says, in the 1960s. While other people were taking drugs and generally rebelling, Eric was pondering, pondering ancient buildings, and one in particular, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Built as a tomb for the pharaoh Cheops, it's made of two and a half million stone blocks. Some of the biggest weigh up to 80 tons and were transported from quarries hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And that was a thousand years before the invention of the wheel. To Eric von Daniken that posed a huge question. Not why the aliens didn't give us the wheel, but another big question. This is the largest man-made monument on earth. Uh, with a high of about uh, 450 feet and weighting 30 million tons. It's quite a piece, I mean, for a, a group of people or architects who came right out from Stone Age time. Von Daniken's theories make academic Egyptologists ever so slightly irritated. Von Daniken doesn't seem to like human beings very much. He does them down. Claims that people you know, are just out of the Stone Age. Well, the Stone Age actually ended some centuries before the pyramids were built, for starters. As far as I'm concerned, Eric von Daniken is a one-man self-publicity machine. I wouldn't characterise what he does in anything like scientific work. But no matter what the experts say, Eric has stuck to his guns. I was never afraid to be ridiculed. I was never afraid that others have a completely different opinion to me. It's wonderful. It's their freedom. But I at least read most of the archaeological books, while the other side 
They have no idea what Eric von Däniken says. He states that you couldn't cut granite except with laser beams. Well, it's been shown that using a copper saw, using just doors in the desert sand as an abrasive, within a week or so you can slice through a great chunk of granite. As far as the professionals are concerned, Egyptians didn't need big lasers and big UFOs to move stones. They relied on their big Egyptian muscles. The transport of blocks of stone isn't an issue. Egyptologists have actually done experiments with large numbers of people and a large block of stone, and you just pull it. Some of the blocks came from Aswan. Take the ceiling of, of the king's chamber. This is from Aswan, but this is 1,000 kilometers away from here. It's not so easy. There's actually a carving in an Egyptian tomb showing them moving a huge statue exactly by that, simply by muscle power. So there's no mystery about how the Egyptians moved great blocks of stone. And here it is. There are no aliens in this ancient Egyptian carving of the pyramids being built, unless they're cunningly disguised as ancient Egyptians, which is probably why it doesn't appear in any of von Daniken's books. I fail to understand why people can't really grasp the fact that these things were built by the men and women who lived at that time in that country. The logic just seems irrefutable. There are some other obvious quirks in Eric's theory about the pyramids. For one thing, he says after the aliens left, humans did build some pyramids using alien technology left behind. How did they do that? That's another mystery. Uh, he's not quite sure. He also says the pharaoh's tombs were actually a cunning attempt to copy the alien science of cryogenics, which preserves the dead in a state of suspended animation. Von Daniken was quickly dismissed as a crank, and still is. But the archaeologists don't have it all their own way, for there's one irritating little puzzle they haven't been able to solve yet. According to the scientists, the Great Pyramid was completed in just 20 years. Given there are over 2 million blocks, that means the Egyptians had to quarry, move and set a block every minute and a half of every day 365 days a year for the whole construction period. One has to admit that the details of pyramid construction remain obscure. Two and a half million blocks in such a short time? Ah, there really uh, must be doubts if you have a reasonable brain. Having wowed the public with his theory about pyramids, von Daniken then set out across the world to find more evidence of more alien ancient activity. These extraterrestrials have left some proof, but the question is complicated. Left what? What could they have left? And what do you know? He saw that proof everywhere. This 5,000-year-old African cave painting, for example, he says, is of a spaceman, complete with helmet. This ancient stone, he claims, shows people using telescopes. And when he climbed into this Mayan tomb in Mexico, he found what his book would later say was a carving of what seemed like an extraterrestrial traveller in his spaceship. Hunched over the controls, the alien seems to have his breathing apparatus in place, and flames are spewing out of his rocket. According to von Daniken, it's just like the liftoff at Cape Canaveral. And then he said he had the revelation which proved his idea had to be true when he visited South America and flew over the famous Nazca Lines in Peru. These ancient patterns drawn into the desert stretch for miles. Some are weird shapes. But mysteriously, those weird shapes can only really be seen from the sky. I had my first flight over Nazca and it was very, very impressive because you can see it only from the air. Then you fly higher, then you see something who looks like airstrips. You think, this is fascinating. This is incredible. This is not normal for the natives. And then the question came, why have they done it? And why exactly here? Archaeologists say these lines are irrigation channels or religious symbols. But von Daniken says he has a much more convincing explanation involving, yes, you guessed it, aliens. We had a mother spaceship around the Earth. From the mother spaceship, smaller vehicle came down. 
and they were looking for some kind of mineral and whatever. And they make their uh, discoveries and disappeared again. The first lines, he said, were left by accident by the aliens who left marks when they landed and took off in their UFOs. The natives came and see the line of landing because sand and little stones are blown away. And now the natives start to make lines like they have seen created by some mysterious god. Eric believes that the Nazca were so impressed by the visiting aliens, they thought they were gods and set out to copy the lines themselves. He says it was an effect similar to that modern Westerners had on Stone Age tribes in the 20th century. New Guinea tribes people thought the first Westerners they saw were gods who had come down from the heavens in silver birds. They worshipped them long after they'd gone and even built model planes and airfields hoping to lure the silver birds back. But it didn't work for the poor old Peruvians though. The aliens never returned. And instead, they got the Spanish. Eric is now convinced that all over the world, ancient man had mistaken aliens for gods. This realization has had a dramatic effect on him. He was a devout Catholic, but isn't anymore. How did it change my life? First of all, it changed my religion. Now I'm praying to some thing which I cannot understand, which I know it exists. As soon as you start to understand it in a cosmical way, it changes your point of view concerning religion and concerning having right. I cannot live anymore with cults and psychology. Eric von Daniken has a brand new explanation for the whole of human development. Creatures from outer space, he says, not only built and designed most ancient monuments, they inspired all the great religions too. This is heady stuff. But there are two small problems. Not a single expert agrees, and none of his evidence stacks up. Take the so-called alien astronaut in his rocket ship from the main tomb. What von Daniken says are controls and flames are in fact well-known Mayan symbols, like this. It's not part of a rocket, but the face of the Mayan Earth God. And these South American stones with supposedly ancient carvings of primitive people gazing at the stars through telescopes, they were exposed by a BBC documentary as fakes, all made by this clever farmer. Ah, but that hasn't stopped Eric's runaway success. His 29 books have sold 63 million copies and been translated into 32 languages. Brian Appleyard is a leading British author who's written on the public's fascination with UFOs. He thinks von Daniken's success is down to people's growing distrust of experts, which leads to a taste for conspiracy theories. Now, people by the 60s and 70s, and because of the Cold War, people were paranoid, convinced that governments were lying to them, convinced that something was concealed, and convinced that the world was not as we were told it was. So people were ripe for a story. They were ready to hear a story about extraordinary things. The von Daniken phenomenon seems unstoppable. He makes so much money from his books, he recently opened his very own theme park, which celebrates his unorthodox beliefs complete with reconstructions of some of the ancient monuments. You see great things like the desert of Nazca in Peru, like Stonehenge. It's a laser show, by the way. In a breathtaking laser show, the visitor experiences the spectacular sight of Stonehenge. There's even a guided tour, which aims to answer all those big questions you've been dying to have answered. Did the mythical continent of Mu ever exist? What is the secret of the underwater structures off the Japanese island of Yanaguni? Von Daniken's success has also inspired a whole new generation of authors, including the likes of New Age writer David Hatcher Childress. People are attracted to Eric's theories, I think, because there are genuinely unexplained mysteries of the past. And we really don't have all of the answers of to why mankind, supposedly a primitive mankind, would go through the tremendous effort 
to build many of these giant monuments. Eric Von Daniken has definitely been one of the pivotal people that I've looked to to grab onto the coattails of his information and really start to look at this information in a new light. But these new believers have a battle on their hands. Scientists don't care whether the mythical continent of Mu ever existed. If aliens visited the Earth, scientists want proof. I think the first thing I would say about whether the knowledge to build pyramids was given to the Egyptians by extraterrestrials is simply where's the evidence? Um, if you think about man's fairly limited extraterrestrial experience of going to the moon, look at the amount of space junk which has been left around simply by going there and coming back. Wouldn't you have thought that if spacemen had been to Egypt and had been, had been teaching the people how to do these things, there'd be at least the odds of leftover broken plastic somewhere? The believers, though, say they found some evidence, although whether it's very convincing is a whole different question. According to them, aliens did leave some space-age technology behind. This 2,000-year-old pottery jar, for example. It was discovered in Baghdad in 1938. Inside it were copper and iron rods, similar to a modern battery. Back in California, Jason Martel has built his very own replica. What we're looking at basically is just a simple clay pot formed with the clay found naturally in that region and then using a simple copper lining and a iron metal rod down the center. This was in, in, in back in their days used either a rubber or an asphalt stopper. Jason fills the pot with an acid solution, vinegar, and now he's expecting something spectacular to happen. All right, the moment of truth. Getting some little numbers here. See that spike? It's going off the chart here now. Look, there we go. See that? Generating four volts right there. What we attribute to ancient man, they deserve a lot more credit than we're giving them. Because obviously we can test the devices with our understandings of technology and get a reading. Here we are, four, four volts right there from the battery. So obviously, they were able to make this happen. What were they using it for? Very possibly electricity. Now what ancient Iraqis might have done with the uh, four volts of electricity, nobody's sure. As for aliens, why would they need an old clay pot when they can zoom through interstellar space? If making a little pot, filling it with vinegar and sticking a bit of bit of copper in it, and then seeing that there's um, a bit some some bubbles appear, is space age technology fine? Back at Eric's theme park, the Baghdad battery is given pride of place, alongside an object based on an Egyptian drawing which he claims was an electric light bulb. The Egyptologists, though, say it's a well-known symbol and is actually just a snake inside a flower, the spoil sports. But Eric is convinced the ancient Egyptians used electricity to light up the dark passages in their pyramids. Someone must have nicked all the wires. Now, you may have been thinking that aliens could have brought us something more useful than the odd light bulb. Well, the same thought occurred to this man. He believes they brought the technology to tap into a cosmic energy source, which they then linked to all the ancient monuments on the Earth. Funny, he doesn't look crackers. One of the things that makes human beings sort of special is that we live in big sophisticated societies full of big complex buildings. It's called civilization. Which is why so many people positively hate the idea that the whole thing might have been kickstarted by aliens. At the heart of the theory is the suggestion that extraterrestrials built the very first big buildings of all back in the ancient past which is all very well and good, but the believers have had a hard time explaining why the aliens did all this. Were they just trying to show off? Not according to this man. Here he is, hiding in Stonehenge.
Now, according to the scientists, Stonehenge was built in 3000 BC. The five ton stones were dragged 170 miles by ancient British people to celebrate the sun, it's thought, which is all very interesting. But not quite interesting enough for David Hatcher Childress. He says Stonehenge might instead have been a fuel stop for ancient aliens. He came up with his interesting theory after he discovered what he says are mysterious energy lines. He believes the Earth is covered with these invisible lines in a strange network. If it all sounds a little unlikely, it has at least got a cool sounding name. The World Energy Grid. The World Grid is an intelligent geometric pattern of the Earth and its energies. A wave of the sunlight hits the Earth and wraps the Earth like a ball of string of energy, creating this energy grid. As you might have guessed, no scientist believes in this grid or the energy that it apparently contains. But according to Hatcher Childress, that's just because they're too sceptical for their own good. The aliens, though, knew about the energy grid and tapped into it. How? By building ancient monuments on key intersections of the grid, obviously. By placing megalithic monuments along this grid, UFOs can then take energy off of this energy grid. And by going to certain power points, like Stonehenge, uh, the craft can hover over these energy spots and draw energy from those spots to help replenish the craft. Now, why these giant fuel stops are all built out of big lumps of stone, Childress doesn't say. But maybe we could tap into this energy nowadays. Of course we can't. Over to you, David, to explain exactly why not. I know many people must have uh, difficulty in imagining this energy grid around the planet, but it's a lot like this racetrack. Here on this racetrack, we have a geometric uh, formation. It's all interconnected. We have the cars running along this energy grid. But if any part of this racetrack is disconnected or broken, the cars won't have the energy anymore and they won't be able to run along the track. So unfortunately, because the ancient monuments like Stonehenge are nothing more than ruins, the world energy grid has broken down. So no free energy for us. But apparently, the aliens didn't just use the ancient monuments for energy. Oh no. Many of the megalithic monuments, including pyramids, Stonehenge, are actually antennas that can be used by UFOs. So there you go. Stonehenge wasn't just a place where druids hung out. It may have been used by ancient aliens to phone home. Or maybe not. Oh sure, they're from another planet. But talking of phoning home, where might these ancient aliens have actually come from? There is one man who should know. He's Seth Shostak. He heads up SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This is a scientific study that's been scouring the constellations for the last 20 years, listening for radio signals from alien life forms. It turns out that lots of scientists believe that life probably did arise somewhere else other than the Earth. After all, the universe contains trillions and trillions of stars. Seth Shostak has devoted his life to being the first to prove it. You know, the universe is vast. It seems that most stars have planets. There are going to be lots of other worlds that are just as nice as the Earth for life. The question is, has life arisen on those worlds? Planet X. Jason Martel is convinced aliens are from there. He says that the ancient Sumerians from Iraq believed in a tenth planet in our solar system, which modern science hasn't yet discovered. Sumerians, he says, believed that's where their gods, the Anunnaki, hung out. Again, the Anunnaki are the beings supposedly that come from Planet X, another planet within our solar system that modern science is currently trying to look for. That planet does exist. It's possible we have ancestors living on that planet. Just a minute, ladies and gentlemen. We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon. 
It was looking good for Planet X when in July 2005 astronomers announced they had actually discovered a big blob way out beyond Pluto. They called it Planet Xena. But they've now realised it's really small and full of gas. So not likely to be the home of the Anunnaki or our ancient alien visitors. But there's one candidate for alien life that obsesses more people than any other. It's our closest neighbour, Mars. It's also the planet that's most like our own. Some scientists are convinced it has water, and for years NASA has been probing and exploring it. So far, no signs of aliens. But in 1976, they were looking for signs of tiny bacteria, when instead they found this. This photo of the plain of Sidonia contains what most astronomers are convinced are some large rocks. But to some people, they look suspiciously like this. Here's one guy who thinks that's exactly what they are. Tom Van Flanden is a renegade astronomer who has his own theory about Mars and junk. You see, according to Flanden, Mars is really the moon of a planet where extraterrestrial humans first evolved, but had to leave in a bit of a hurry when it exploded. Left behind was all sorts of junk, including pyramids. The most interesting speculation about the origin of the artifacts on Mars is that the original human race was on the parent world that has since exploded. They built uh, things on their moon, Mars, uh, but before the end of their civilization, which they saw coming, they transferred um, their species uh, to, uh, to the most nearly habitable planet, which would have been Earth. We'd sure like to get higher resolution images of this and other pyramid-shaped objects uh, on Mars and see if they are truly pyramids. But are these really pictures of Martian pyramids, you ask? Tobias Owen was a NASA scientist on the mission that took the photographs. He's what you might call unconvinced. My job there was to examine pictures as they were coming in of the surface of Mars in regions that we thought would be safe for the spacecraft to land. There was a small group of people who felt that this was an example of an alien construction, that there was life on Mars, or there had been life on Mars. NASA promptly issued a denial, which for believers was obviously proof of a monumental cover-up. You know, the interesting thing about NASA's track record, NASA, National Aeronautics Space Association, could also stand for never a straight answer. In its inception in 1959 or so, NASA consulted a big think tank called the Brookings Institute, which advised NASA, if you ever find extraterrestrials, these things need to be handled cautiously. For one, society in general and religious institutions aren't quite ready to accept an extraterrestrial presence. Pyramids on Mars were spooky enough, but then things got really out of hand when NASA released another batch of photographs from the plain of Sidonia. And near the pyramid shapes was something else. A rocky outcrop that some people felt had an eerie resemblance to something familiar. Something that ancient astronaut believers have long connected with aliens. Yep, that other famous tourist site in Egypt. Very interestingly enough, NASA first took an image of the face on Mars and they labeled it head. And uh, this, this photograph was quickly dismissed by NASA as a trick of light and shadow. It's not really a face on Mars, it's just a lighting angle difference. Wrong answer. Here we have a face in pyramids on Mars, a sphinx in pyramids in Egypt. There has to be a connection, a Mars-Earth connection. To the scientists though, it was just a natural feature. This is the kind of thing that we see on the Earth in various places. There's a famous one in New Hampshire in the United States called the, the Old Man in the Mountain. And there's a tendency among us humans to try to see images of ourselves in nature. And here was a perfect example, but happened to be on Mars. The common sense explanation is simple. Human beings are just hardwired to recognize faces, even when faces aren't there. Over to a psychologist to explain Faces are very important to humans from infancy. 
They're so important that we perceive faces even in a stimulus that is not a face. For example, this plate of eggs in front of me looks very much like a face. We can see eyebrows, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth very readily. Well, when I look at the first image that was taken of the structures on Mars, I see it very, very clearly as a face. Here's an eye, here's the bottom part of a nose, here's the outline of a face. This is a low resolution image and I'm quite convinced by that interpretation. However, when I look at the more recent image, which is a much more high resolution image, I'm very hard pressed to see that as a face. Now, could I see it as a face? I could. I could go and look for the same features that I saw in the first image and try to pick them out here. But in the high resolution image where it is not very ambiguous, it is much harder to perceive this as a face. We now have exquisite images of uh, the surface of Mars that are being taken as we speak, in fact, by uh, the Mars Express spacecraft. And we see extraordinary detail on the surface of that planet, but we see no evidence of anything artificial. So Mars may not have a sphinx, and it probably doesn't have any pyramids. And so far, it hasn't got any signs of life at all. So where do the ancient aliens come from? It's time to consult someone who should really know, an alien herself. Lisa Royal Holt, a cosmic medium, claims she can communicate with aliens. Apparently, she hooks up to the extraterrestrials by putting herself into a self-hypnotic trance. She says she's been doing it for years. It wasn't until I was in college when I was studying hypnosis, and I learned to put myself in an altered state. And when I did that, I started to realize that I was very intuitive, and that sometimes I would receive messages. I'm able to actually hear or sense the communications and then uh, verbally communicate them. Right now, her favorite phone buddy is a female alien called Sasha, who takes over Lisa's brain and communicates through Lisa's voice. We are about to do a channeling session. I will go into a meditative state. You are going to hear from Sasha, who says she's from the Pleiades. You mean the Pleiades, a cluster of stars in the constellation of Taurus, otherwise known as the Bull. Tell us, Sasha, if it's not too personal a question, what do girls from the Pleiades look like? <clears throat> in my world, I actually do have what you would know to be a physical body, though it exists in a slightly different dimension. I could walk down your street and pass as a human, but you would probably look at me and, and feel there was something strange about me. Sasha says her people were intergalactic empire builders who roamed the universe thousands of years ago, taking over other planets and building vast monuments as they did. Ironically, one of their first colonies was apparently on Mars. We used some of the bases there as colonies. What has been found now on Mars represents the tip of the iceberg of what is still on Mars. But Mars was merely a stopover for Sasha's people. She says they soon turned their attention to us. My forefathers thus have been very interested in Earth for a very, very long time. It's time to find out the answer to the biggest question of all about the ancient astronauts. Why did they come here? According to Sasha, they may have been up to more than building monuments and starting civilization. Could they have created the human race? If alien astronauts really did visit us thousands of years ago, and that's rather a big if, then the obvious question is why? Well, according to Lisa Holt, or rather her alien mate Sasha, there's a perfectly sensible answer. The aliens chanced upon our pre-human ancestors and then started messing with our DNA, a process she calls upliftment. 
my sources have said that the extraterrestrial genetic projects on Earth have been going on for thousands of years. If your pre-humans were not uplifted by extraterrestrial genetics, your evolution as human beings would not have progressed as far as it has. You would still be in the evolutionary phase if it was not for the, the little bit of upliftment that was done. Lisa and Sasha are not the only people to believe this theory. They came here 300,000 years ago, created a primitive worker based off the Neanderthal man that was here evolving naturally, and created us. So an extraterrestrial crew comes here. They take one cell. They change the DNA code in the cell. You put it in the womb of a female of the same species. This female will give birth to a child. It's just what we would call the missing link. If the believers in ancient aliens are right, then evolution didn't gradually create humans. We were instead cooked up in the alien equivalent of a test tube. Spooky stuff. To me that explains so much. And it also explains psychologically a sense of abandonment that the human race seems to, to feel. That these beings helped in our creation but then never allowed us to remember who our parents were. Hmm. Now it all might sound like cobblers. But the notion of visiting aliens as godlike creators takes alien conspiracy 